guys, welcome back to the Wall Street Bull. Anthony here. I hope you're all doing well and staying positive out there. It is never a dull and boring moment in crypto, finance, or the stock market. That is why I love doing daily market updates. Now today, yes, it is Sunday night here in Melbourne. It's nearly uh, 10 p.m. I should say it's just after 10 p.m. Um, just came across a very interesting interview with Brad Garlinghouse uh, in Switzerland, I believe it was. Just pay attention to what he's saying. Also pay attention to the people sitting in the freaking audience. Tell me in the comments who you see, all right? Just pay attention to this, guys. This is incredible. I thought it was fascinating. I was just scrolling through uh, and I uh, did see this and it was freaking awesome. So pay attention to that. Comment below in the comments, all right? Anyway, guys, my bots are doing incredibly well with three commas. Uh, those of you who have joined the Wall Street Boy University would have gotten these bots uh, set up, my latest ones. Uh, yesterday, we did like over nearly $250 in profit, so I'm really happy about that. Um, also, uh, Earn Curve as well, the application. Thank you to those of you who have uh, generously donated to this. Again, all of that is going to be used to uh, build this incredible app that I'm you know, been wanting to do for a very freaking long time. So thank you very much. If you have not joined up uh, to the wait list on earncurveinvest.com, go do that. The link is in the video description. And again, if you can donate to this, it would really mean a lot to me. I do have, I'm not kidding, a target of $100,000. Uh, and it's pretty crazy. I might even have to start a Kickstarter, but yeah, it, it's going to happen. I'm making it happen, guys, because again, I really want to share what I've learned and uh, give the ability for the, uh, younger people out there to have less complexities uh, to invest in Wall Street. So uh, uh, for the future as well. So go join up to Earn Curve Invest. Go and have a look. The link is below. And uh, guys, enjoy this uh, interview with Brad Garlinghouse because it's fascinating. And uh, it just cements my position on uh, XRP and Ripple as a company. This project is going to be enormous, guys. It's, it's really, really cool. And just again, pay attention to who's in the freaking audience listening to Brad speak. Pay attention to that. Enjoy, guys. I'll see you tomorrow, right? EC is, is a really risky undertaking for a central bank, but you know you highlight that it's risky uh, not to issue a CBDC uh, as well because then uh, uh, you've left it to the private sector and then you need to worry about uh, the regulation of the private sector. Uh, but now we have someone from the private sector <laughs> Uh, Brad Garlinghouse, who is the CEO of the financial technology company Ripple. I will start off by uh, also thanking Charles, thanking Thomas, thanking Christine. Uh, it's an honor to be included. And uh, as was introduced, uh, I think they saved me for last so that I could uh, talk about the, the, the private sector version of this. I also start by kind of explaining the basics of what Ripple is and what Ripple is not. Uh, Ripple is a private company. We're based in California, uh, about three or 400 employees around the world. And we're trying to solve a problem. We're selling technologies to banks and financial institutions to solve a cross-border payments problem. To be clear, we have not focused on the central bank digital currency issuance. Uh, our view is very much there needs to be interoperability globally. And even in a world of CBDCs, you still need interoperability to, to solve that problem. Uh, also, before I dive in, you know, my comments are more focused on kind of explaining how Ripple's approaching this, this problem as opposed to just CBDCs. But I thought it worth spending a moment on how we think about blockchain at large and why it is such an interesting technology and I think appropriate for central banks and commercial banks to be looking at. For me, the novelty of any blockchain technology is the ability for two parties to transact without trust, but with certainty. So today, anytime we transact, we are transacting through a central counterparty, whether that be a correspondent bank where Ripple is focused, or that be a Visa or American Express, what have you. The opportunity around blockchains is to change that dynamic. And I think many industries, whether it's payments, what we're talking about today, or securities, or even loans, any of those transactions, I think, can be uh, disrupted and made more efficient through blockchain technologies. All right, so with that kind of brief introduction, you know, I'll be brief on some of my comments here because uh, we've, we've touched on this already. You know, global, I think we would largely have few uh, arguments with the idea that global payments today have not caught up with the age of the internet. 
uh, you know, we talk about slow, we've talked about the, the, the 14 days that Norman mentioned. Uh, you know, the, the the younger generations today are accustomed to be able to open up their smartphone and click on a button and have an ice cream delivered in 20 minutes. They aren't going to be very happy when it takes their payments, you know, days and lots of costs uh, mm -hmm. to get to them. Another thing that is, I think, often lost upon us is the opaqueness uh, in the problems with which, you know, correspondent banking currently operates. There's a, a 6% error rate self-published that 6% of all SWIFT transactions require human intervention. Now, that doesn't mean they don't get there. It just means that human intervention adds time, it adds cost, and what have you. And, and lastly, when we talk about cost, it isn't just about transaction fees. It's also about the pre-funding required for commercial banks and even large corporations and the cost of that capital. What's amazing to me is that these costs are often born or burdened the populations that are least able to afford them. Uh, you know, data from the IMF and the World Bank would you know say that the the average remittance costs around 600 basis points in a world where we think about the internet enabling kind of real time instant information. Why can't we use these new technologies to build an internet of value? Uh, when we look at the, this, the current dynamic I was just talking about, the pre-funding, you know, if the correspondent banking network requires this pre-funding, not, I'm not talking about a central bank level as much as I'm talking about it at a commercial level. And oftentimes, even when I'm meeting with uh, senior people at you know, various banks or financial institutions, you know, they'll talk about their costs to fund into the Mexican peso and they'll, you know, cite a very, very low number. But what that doesn't include is the cost of capital to sitting at a bank in the, a bank there. It also restricts competition because it requires capital to get it there. Our view in the future is you don't have to have this pre-funding and instead you can use a digital asset to have global liquidity on demand. Now we build upon a tech stack of an open source technology called XRP. XRP you know, originally was built by some engineers who had seen some of the flaws of Bitcoin and the challenge of, the, of scalability around Bitcoin, where Bitcoin today, uh, on a per transaction basis, you know, it's rather slow and rather expensive. XRP is very, very fast, about a thousand times faster per transaction and a thousand times cheaper per transaction. The other dynamic, of course, of correspondent banking is some of the more quote unquote exotic currencies, exotic corridors have been left uh, you know, to kind of stand on their own. And it, the liquidity in digital assets could be applied to actually make that much more uh, democratized in a level playing field. Ripple's vision from the beginning really has been to apply these technologies in the same way that TCP IP and HTTP are the technologies underpinning the Internet of Information. These blockchain technologies will be the underpinnings of an Internet of Value where we have connected devices, we have connected information that will allow payments to flow. And as Norman was describing, you know, if you're a large corporation moving $100 million, that's one thing. If you're a, if you're a you know, freelancer working in the Philippines doing design work for a company in London and you want to get paid $30 or 30 pesos, Philippine pesos, you know, that's not a transaction that can easily be enabled. And in fact, for the companies that enable that, they require the freelancer to set up an account and they don't actually pay it out until there's you know, roughly 1,000 USD sitting in that account and then they would pay it out. So Ripple has come to the market with three products and I, I will just briefly touch on them. The, the first one is called XCurrent and the reason why I'll point this out is because XCurrent doesn't touch crypto. XCurrent is just you know, kind of Swift 2.0. It's a messaging framework that is uh, much more efficient and real time as compared to it's, you know, fiat to fiat. Uh, that typically is how we start working with any bank or any financial institution is on a fiat to fiat basis. The bottom product we see down here is called XRapid. And XRapid is really where we use XRP to fund real time liquidity. We brought this product to market in Q4 of last year. And immediately we saw the, the demand for that type of product from banks, financial institutions who want to open up new corridors for payments, but don't want to open up new Nostro Vostro relationships and the friction and overhead that goes with that. The third product is really simply a, an API that allows corporates to do real time payouts into this network we call RippleNet. The challenge here, as many of you may know, is there's corporations ranging from Uber to Amazon to you know, 
more uh, less technically efficient companies, this, they employ hundreds of engineers that just integrate into payment networks around the world. They're building custom APIs into payment networks in the Philippines or Indonesia, into the Middle East, what have you, so they can enable those payouts. We think by standardizing on an open source API, we can make that more efficient for everyone. We've been fortunate, uh, and actually, you know, I, I meant to say up front, I had a, a very good conversation before we uh, started this panel. It, I, one of the things I worry about when we talk about blockchain technologies is sometimes they are a solution in search of a problem instead of a problem in search of a solution. There's many times when people come and talk to me about blockchain solutions and I ask them, why can't we just use a database? Why is a blockchain a better solution? And you know, in Silicon Valley, where I've been for 22 years, it's sometimes it's catnip for investors. It's just to get investors excited where a database would be more efficient. Now, the reason why I offer these remarks at the beginning of this slide is I think one of the reasons why Ripple has done well is we've been very focused on solving a specific problem for a specific customer, and we've been focused on that for a long time. And we've been fortunate, therefore, to get uh, about 200 customers globally now working with us in one way or another. So I'll, I'll conclude just by saying, I, I think the excitement around blockchain is well-founded, uh, and it will impact many, many industries in the same way the Internet of Information 20 years ago has impacted many, many industries. But I also think sometimes that the hype gets ahead of the reality, and we need to be clear about what problems we're trying to solve, whether it's at a central bank level, a commercial bank level, or in other industries altogether. With that, I will turn it back to you, Charles. Uh, thanks very much, Brad. Well, I'd, I'd like to hear more about that. I, it, uh, it certainly sounds promising, and, and I think we'd all like to know more about uh, how, you know, counterparty risk is uh, avoided here and, and, and uh, the problems of foreign exchange liquidity.